I kind of look at it this way. Uh, once your basic needs are met, then you can begin to look for higher, a higher level of experience, a uh, more rewarding level of experience. And I think that uh, in our affluent society, so many of our basic needs are so well taken care of that uh, this would explain the attraction to such sports as cycling and, and kayaking and mountain climbing and sports where a person can hang it out a little bit. Okay, how's mine? You're still down there around A. That's not working. Oh, well, we just locked it all. I don't know, is anybody else? Pat, are you going to go and register? Uh, yeah. Okay, next man. What do you mean? If you lose your concentration, you may, you may just lose the race. It could be early in the race, late in the race. But you've always got to be aware of how you're feeling and how your competitors are feeling. I always try to get myself, position myself in the upper third. Watch for some riders that, that may go off the front that have the potential of uh, succeeding in a break. So that, that's the primary, primary uh, thinking behind, I think, a sprinter, is to keep the pack intact. To control the race because you want a, you want a bunch finish. You don't want, uh, you don't want to have it dragged out and then have a, a long distance man, say, uh, come in ahead of you. It's about 50-50, I think. Maybe more physical uh, than tactics. If you're incredibly strong, then you can, you can ride foolishly. You can stay out in front and break wind for everyone, and then maybe pull a flyer and, and do well at the end and win the race. But uh, the way things are going in the United States, you really can't do that. People are training and getting in incredibly good condition, and so you have riders that are in equal ability just about. So it's, it's usually the tactics. Who saves the most energy and, and who rides the thinking race? All the precautions, but again, exercise some caution. Don't make any fast move type thing without knowing where the other riders are with respect to you. Just common sense going through the first corner. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Everyone hold on tight, a lot of bumps. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry, that's the other thing. Your arm it is a little bumpy. So I'll be just resting on your on your bars because my hand might come off. So hang on to them. Okay. Riders ready? Go. <laughs>
I think the more you race, the more you train, you become uh, able to adapt to that physical inconvenience, that pain, that suffering that all cyclists must be able to surmount. You, you tr just try to put the pain out of your mind and you concentrate on what, you're, what you have to do. What is, what is the work ahead of you? If this is the bottom and this is halfway up and here is the top of pain threshold, most of us function at about this level. The, the business of training brings us up to here. A super amount of training, really hard training like a professional road rider would do, would bring you pretty close to your, your pain threshold where you reach a stage of, of utter exhaustion and collapse. With wind and terrain both neutral, that is to say there's no headwind and you're not climbing a hill, depending upon the speed that you're going, there's a 15 to, I've heard as high as 35, 40% advantage slipstreaming one rider. Uh, when you're in the middle of a pack of riders, I think that that increases. I feel it within myself that it does, and when you're at the very back of a pack, I think it increases even more. There's just a tremendous uh, uh, slipstreaming effect behind a, a group of riders. There's a tremendous slipstreaming effect behind one rider. Mark and I were talking uh, just yesterday, and he read someplace that uh, there is also a facilitating effect to the first rider, to having someone sit behind him. In other words, he'll be able to go faster than one rider would out there all alone. The first rider, by himself, the turbulence just comes in right on his wheel, and it sort of sucks back on him like an eddy in a river. But if you put two riders there, then that, that turbulence goes clear back behind the second rider. So the second rider is having to pull against that, that eddy effect but he's, he's got the counter effect that he doesn't have to punch a hole in the, in the air. So they're both getting a lot of advantage there. I'm dropped. I lose, I lose that concentration. I keep wondering what the hell I'm doing. Uh, you know, why am I here? A hundred miles, uh, hundred miles out, and uh, uh, twenty miles to go. And I, you know, it's hot. And
and I'm all by myself, and I, I kind of get bummed out like that. A hill climber uh, has to have a high power to weight ratio to start with. Any excess weight, especially uh, on the physical body, uh, requires that much more blood and, and oxygen, which is a rarity at that altitude in this country. Well, in this country, we don't call them hills anyway. They're mountains, and that's the difference. A good hill climber is not necessarily a mountain climber. Sometimes you feel you could have gone harder and maybe won the race. Immediately after the race, you're incredibly exhausted and you're breathing hard. And in about five minutes, everything calms down, the heart rate goes back down, and you can really get within yourself and see what you did in the race, what kind of accomplishments you made, where you went wrong or what you did right. Physically, though, uh, you, you feel effects of a hard race for a couple of hours, and then you get incredibly hungry.